Thank you so much, Isad. That was like amazing. <laughs> I've been fortunate to see it at Yorkshire Sculpture Park on August the 1st with Tamina as well and um, all the amazing people from the local Bangladeshi community in the Beeston that you brought to that night. But it's it's just brilliant to see, again, in an, in this indoor setting um, and, in, you know, the incredible quality that we've got here in the sound. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> I'm just going to um, introduce Shazad um, in case some of you may not know his work already. But he's um, really internationally renowned for creating art that transcends the boundaries of painting, sculpture and digital media. His practice often involves collaboration and knowledge exchange, mapping up across multiple audiences and communities. He is fascinated with esoteric otherness, the environment and architectures, all things which you can see today in the film. Both material and virtual, you interweave stories, realities and symbolism to create richly layered artworks. We're really, really delighted to welcome you back to Leeds. You um, studied here at Leeds Beckett, which was then Leeds Met, and you did your PhD here. So good to see you again. And also you showed at Leeds Art Gallery in 2014 um, with a work that with Leeds Art Gallery and from a video umbrella. So thanks for coming back to see us here today. Um, Shazad was born in 1974, and he's currently living and working in London. And you've had solo exhibitions across the world internationally and shown in biennales and film festivals. Currently, you're showing a work in Folkestone, um, ter Terrarium, which I've heard great things about, which is I think, a dystopian vision of the future, isn't it, as well? It is, yes. Yeah. <laughs> and also, I was um, reading that you've, just, you've recently been commissioned for um, um, Visions of Paradise on a Beckham Street estate in Dagenham, which is with a virtual reality and permanent sculpture work as well, which looks fantastic. So I look forward to seeing that in the future. Um, so we're really excited to bring you here together with Tamina. Welcome, Tamina Begum. Thank you. <laughs> Tamina is a mixed media artist, a poet, a workshop facilitator, and currently studying for her MA in art psychotherapy. She's the creative director of Creative Roots Project and an associate of Hatch Projects. Tamina lives and works in Beeston in Leeds. Tamina was recently awarded the Tetley's Panic Bursary, and which enabled her to develop some, a project called the Colour Palette, which is a community research project that aims through art to give access to voices within a Bangladeshi community about their lived experience of racism. And this has seemed like really an excellent project. And uh, on the Techlies website, there's some great documentation of that work you've done. Check it out, guys. <laughs> and we're also really delighted to work with you on Yorkshire Sculpture International this summer. You're one of our engagement artists, and you've been working with the Bangladeshi community in Beeston. And um, yeah, thank you for that. And hopefully you'll have a chance to talk a little bit about that so people know more. Um, for Yorkshire Sculpture International, we have the commissions and engagement project. Engagement's really heart of what we do, so um, it's lovely that you're here this evening as well. Thank you. I just really wanted to start off, Shazad, because it's been an incredible journey that we were so fortunate as um, Yorkshire Sculpture International to come in quite near the beginning um, when you were, I think, you know, the process of applying for a British Council Digital Collaboration Fund grant, and international aspect is really important, a part of our project, so we were we heard about your project in development and we came on board. <laughs> and um, it's been great to be part of that journey. But I guess I just sort of wondered a little bit of background about it. Did you have it as something in your head already that you'd wanted to do for a while? Or when that funding came around, it sort of really came into being? I guess, um, well, thank you for, you know, jumping on the bandwagon early. It was really great to have your support and to know that Yorkshire was firmly part of the project from the get-go. Um, I guess before the funding opportunity came up, um, uh, the director of the Samdani Art Foundation in Dhaka had called me out of the blue and just said, would you, you know, um, we have a really good relationship, but she sort of called me out of the blue and said, would you be interested to revisit the 71 concert for Bangladesh? And I went, oh, that's quite a tall order, but okay, tell me more. And we we got into a really interesting conversation about about how we how we felt about the concert. You know, for, for people who don't know that much about its legacy it you know live aid and pretty much every major charity concert kind of imitated it was inspired by it it was like the first of its kind to kind of really bring musicians together in aid of a charitable cause um but you know and and it continues to provide money through the united nations you know it's still it's still generating funds today so we were kind of sort of somewhat in awe of its legacy, you know, a very respectful of it, but also quite critical of, of it, at least now. And we had this really interesting chat about how, in a way, 
it was actually Ravi Shankar's idea, and he took it to his mate George Harrison, and then it ended up in Madison Square Gardens, and Ravi Shankar and the other South Asian musicians were like really minor support acts, and it was all sort of, dare I say it, old white blokes with guitars. Yeah, I think, I think that's the key thing for me. Good evening, audience. Hi, hi, hi Jane. Hi, Shazad. Um, for me, it was congratulations on the concert. It's just magnificent. Um, for me, as a British Bangladeshi woman born in Leeds, it was the first time in my life where, I, on the 1st of August, I went something and it represented me, my identity, my culture, my heritage. And we were at the forefront. We weren't a side act. Bangladesh was on the spotlight. So for me, that just like adding on to Jane's um, question, why this project and why particularly Bangladesh? Well, I mean, you'd have to ask the foundation some of that, but I, you know, f um, my best answer is, I guess, because I've worked with, you know, film, digital media, and music pretty much my whole career, and they were really interested in how to put all of that together. And then my, the next thought was, well, actually, you know, my origins are British Pakistani, and you know, in terms of the. The Liberation War of seventy one. The Pakistanis were the bad guys. Yeah. So were you conscious of that then? Oh God, hugely. Yeah. And it became really important to kind of think about why I was doing this, what my role in it would be, and 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 how to sort of take that on. Um, and it became very important to go. Okay, I feel this is complex and complicated, and I feel awkward. Mm -hmm. And and then it's. I mean, I wasn't even born in seventy one, but. I'm quite aware of, of the history and, you know, how... Absolutely. And I think, for me, bringing so many groups down, I was so lucky to somehow become the partnership artist for, for this project. And initially, when myself and Helen from Yorkshire Sculpture Park uh, were chatting, we thought we'll take one minibus down. It ended up being three minibuses and a coach down on um, the 1st of August, which was tremendous because it was so popular and it seemed like it was such a joyful, happy, happy thing to look forward to after COVID and the other we've had. But I just wanted to unpick a little bit, little bit with you in terms of, if anybody doesn't know, it was a war, it was a genocide. And for many people, especially the older generation in this country, British Bangladeshis, which I brought down, many, many, many women um, from the Kushinanas, which just means happy grandmas, they had, they had the trauma brought them back to them just by saying it was something to do with 50 years of independence. I know myself having a conversation with my mom, and she was, she was pregnant at the, that time in 1971 with my older brother, and she had to move from the town that she was living in to a rural village in a boat back to her dad, so my granddad's. And the whole family, including the extended family and everything, had to live in this in this sh um, shed hut, all on top of each other while she was pregnant. And the one thing that she remembered was having to eat dal for so many months, and she hated it. <laughs> and um, with the year that we've had in COVID, many of them things of being locked in and tied in came back to the forefront of many people's head. Um, so whilst they didn't have the bare essentials, we didn't have the bare essentials, toilet roll. Um, but, you know, did you ever think of the psychological and emotional impact on what you were making? I think it was, it was really key to kind of, if I was going to step in at all, it was like, oh, you know, what is my role in this? And I think I thought from the get go, you know, with a lot of my films and digital works, you know, I'm often inviting musicians, composers, improv performers to work on the score, the soundtrack. And then it became very important with this to be, okay, this isn't my universe. It's actually just, I'm just a stage manager. And I'm going to take a step back and let it be led. And I said that very much to the foundation, that this has to be led by others. Yeah, because... It was fantastic to see so many different artists and performers right at the front. Um, like Jen, Jane said, not at the backing singers. Um, I think that there were so many issues that were raised within that 
film and so beautiful to see so much of the Bangladesh architecture, agriculture, rural life, city life, development. And I just wondered about your reasoning behind having to want subtitles. Uh, because anybody who knows the reason, one of the key reasons why Bangladesh wanted to become liberated was the fact they wanted to keep their own language, their mother tongue language, which was um, so important. I, and I remember, so my dad came in the 1950s and then my mum followed in the 1970s. And growing up, we were we had to go to Bengali school every Saturday and Sunday. And me and my siblings hated it, absolutely hated it, because the rest of our friends were going out to play. Um, so I know for my mum and dad, it was really key for us to learn our mother tongue language, which I'm so grateful for now because, you know, our future generations like my kids, they don't know it. Do you know what I mean? So I just wanted to ask your reasoning behind wanting to have the English subtitles or whether you could have let the music and the words on the wrapping speak for itself. I, yeah, two answers to that. The first was I was very aware of you know, the whole reason behind the Liberation War, you know, and, and all the tragedies that went with it, being basically started by the attempts by what was then West Pakistan to suppress, you know, East Pakistani, or uh, what, you know, all the Bangla language, the Bangla, and, and, you know, what was called the war on words. So it was a cultural genocide before it became a physical genocide. And, and you know, so for me, it was really important to put the stress on language, but then the subtitles were super important to me because actually, since I was a kid, you know, and I think it's 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 often uh, the fate of a lot of immigrant kids is to go to your local record shop and ninety nine percent of the record shop is folk, jazz, you know, rock, and world music is this one little section in the corner that represents actually probably the opposite proportion of the globe. And, you know, it's just something I've carried around with me as a little resent, as, well, a reasonably big resentment most of my most of my life. And it was, and, and even then the people who are into world music, I find it sometimes really reductive. And it's like, it's easy to exoticize something if you don't know what's being said. So for me- I, I would add that sometimes music speaks for itself and the depth and the understanding is there. So many of the first immigrants that came over, so the older ladies that I'm talking about, I remember when we took them to Yorkshire Sculpture Park and just growing up, everybody everybody knew um, Bangla music was played in their household. Whilst they didn't know the language and the spoken written words, it, one of the ladies said to me afterwards at, at Yorkshire Sculpture Park, the music felt like the heart's beating on a string. So I just would want to delve a bit more into it, maybe, you know, why, was it for the wider audience or could you have left it as it was? I don't know. I mean, obviously, I've, I felt really strongly and I also feel the poetry needs to be understood because I've often found, you know, even, you know, friends or people would put a record on not knowing the words, whether, you know, um, I don't speak Bangla, I speak both Hindi and Urdu and so obviously I would understand the lyrics and they just be, you know, it's easy to make something less powerful when you when it can become background music. And I think, you know, some of the just to understand the sort of poetry that runs across Bangla, Urdu, Hindi in song is is just I mean, you know, it makes my hand my heart my sort of hair stand on end when uh, say Mumita Huck in the in the second act talks about uh, the deserts thirsting for clouds. You know, you need to know that. You know, you need to know what that is saying. And you know, equally, I think with you know with Gali Boyrana and Tabib, the final act, it's yes, they're really great. They're a really great hip hop act, and you can just go, oh yeah, it's some sort of foreign hip hop. You know, I remember different moments growing up and you know I, I had friends who were sort of African or whatever and you know and you'd get into you know I've, I've been a big fan of Senegalese hip-hop for years but I've been desperate to know what's actually being said so I don't feel excluded and so for me it was really important to share it and to share the words because you know as it says at the final they actually you know we, we put it politely to not upset the government but you know they called out the Bangladeshi government on 
on diverting money that should have gone to education and forced them to give it back because they've got such a grassroots following in Bangladesh. And and I think and their words are powerful and you need to Yeah, I I, I agree. I was just questioning you. <laughs> <laughs> um, but but also with that same token, the depth of understanding with language is so different. So from Bangla to English and English so there's certain words in English that you know, Bangladesh just wouldn't get and vice versa. And it's that depth of that language which one word could translate into twenty English English words. That was my questioning behind it. So yeah, I, I agree with you, but I, I also think that some things are powerful just on its own. And you know, it was quite an interesting forum with the translation because it was so Rooks Mini, who's one of the curators of the project from the Samdani Art Foundation, you know, she worked on the translations and really took that on. But even still we were bouncing around like, should that be translated as this or as that? And what's you know, trying, I guess, around a table to kind of workshop, you know, what is the, as you say, because sometimes, you know, a translation is never exact. And, and sometimes you're, you're, you're choosing, you know, particularly with some of those uh, older songs that are kind of brought in, you're, you're, you, you have no access to the original author. So you're trying to kind of think, what is the metaphor that's trying to be arrived at? Absolutely, absolutely. There were so many key themes in the film, in the concept of Bangladesh, um, climate change. Um, you know, but one of the key big things for me was the poverty. And I just um, wanted to explore that a little bit more. So in Bangladesh, the absolute relative poverty uh, that's going on there. And it just made me think of the same sort of poverty that's going on in this country at the moment, particularly the communities and families that I work with. And I've, as well as an artist, I've worked over 20 years in health inequalities as well. Um, and for me, one of the driving forces that benefits health and well-being is access to arts and culture. And that's why it was so wonderful, the 1st of August, um, concert in Bangladesh and bringing so many communities to Yorkshire Sculpture Park, something that they've lived here all their life but never have, have had, ever have access to. We live, many communities live in inner South Leeds, five minutes from the city centre. We've got fantastic arts and culture. We've got fantastic galleries, museums. We've got the playhouse. But for so many communities, the access is not there so far but yet so near and I just for me in my creative practice it's a really big element to have all sections of communities and all sections of society access the work that I'm trying to do and I just wondered whether that was a key thing when making concert in Bangladesh for yourself. I mean that was even with the partnership with YSI that was one of the first things that I think was important to both of us. Um, I, I, sorry, Jane, I shouldn't speak for you, but no, no, absolutely. Um, I, I mean, I guess it, in a way, how you were saying how it's different from 1971, the concert for Bangladesh, about how for you it's really important to include diverse um, musicians within it, people from different communities. Um, I remember you getting very excited when Gully Boy Rama was on board at this <laughs> to 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 bring up um, those those different musicians. Um, I think it's, yeah, it was it was right, clear right from the beginning. And I think it was also quite important, you know, thinking about the kind of large diaspora community, you know, around Wakefield to kind of get them into, you know, because I think it's that sort of thing, isn't it? I, I mean, you know, even growing up, it was, you know, it was quite a disappointment to my family that I didn't become a doctor. Um, or an accountant. Or an, or an accountant, exactly, they would have loved that. You know, I don't think I would have loved it so much. No disrespect to accountant friends uh, Sorry. in the audience. But, uh, you know, and it was, it was, it was such a sort of uh, fight because, and I, I always thought it was just because it was seen as a bit, you know, you were seen as a bit of a waster. But I also, as I've sort of gone on working in the arts, it's also that sort of, I think it's an unspoken thing of, oh, that's not for us. And I think a lot of my career has been staked on, on pushing those, pushing those those boundaries or those blocks and, and actually realizing they're not just in South Asian communities. It's also, you know, um, you know, it's interesting. I just um, actually last night had a, a, there's a show I curated opened in London of all South Asian artists. And I was, you know, I was I was talking to somebody at the opening saying I never thought I'd find myself at this point because, you know, 
very early in my career, I used to hate being in shows where I was pigeonholed only with other South Asian artists. Like we didn't deserve to, you know, be an artist outside of a kind of ethnic sort of pigeonholing. And and I was just like, it's kind of it's strange to me to have come full circle. But it, I said I felt like like with with this project, you know, I think sometimes time, you know, it's just the fact of times changing. You can. Like just changing the syntax of the you know the original concept, which was the concept for Bangladesh, to the concept from, you know, words have power, and and sometimes the simplest kind of shift can make, can cause ripples in other ways. So for me, it was like, why why like twenty years later is it okay? And I was asking actually one of the artists in the show who I've known for like twenty five years. Um, she reminded me, but I I said, oh, you know. Why have I done this? And she was like, because you're, const you're constructing the framework by which we are seen rather than someone else attempting to kind of be reductive. This is empowering. And it was like, okay, you know, it's... Is that the same for all your works? And from the start of your career, did you want to have access to everybody to attend? Who, who do you make the out for? Is there a certain audience or are you trying to get the widest possible audience? it's interesting because I remember at art school you know often I was if I didn't make work about South Asia they're like why aren't you making work about South Asia and it's like you know and it's interesting because not all my work relates to South Asia a lot of it you know I'm very passionate about marine ecosystems and and it's sort of interesting because occasionally I go uh, you know a curator will go oh but why do you do this stuff and it's like oh so can only white people talk about the environment and, you know, and it's like, you know, it's like, it's so interesting how people, even with the best intentions, fall into the trap of a sort of colonial kind of framework as a default, you know. And so it is important, you know, where I've done work, nothing to do with South Asia about climate. I mean, I've just been shooting a film last month in Senegal dealing with mangrove ecosystems, which also, as we've seen, exist in Bangladesh. And I think, you know, mangroves are something I'm very passionate about because in terms of biodiversity and sea level rise mitigation, they are one of our best and most organic hopes um, to kind of remedy some of the kind of uh, imminent <laughs> problems we face. Absolutely. So do you, do you feel like it, it's the artist's um, issue when you're making it to for them access to them people, or do you feel like it's the museums, the curators? Is it part of your process? Because for me, like you said, it's not just minority communities that I work with that when we did the concept of Bangladesh I brought one of my groups I run in Hunslet which is all white working working class women as, as, as well as the Bangladesh community and I think there's two key things it's access to funds and the finances to access some of these spaces and then second of all which is the most important like you said do I have a sense of belonging to be in these spaces have I got the confidence to walk into these places? And do I belong? So I just wonder if we could explore that a little bit. Yeah, I mean, that's, I think it's, it's fundamentally important, isn't it? Because if you've ever been marginalized and you don't respond with empathy across anybody who could ever be possibly marginalized, there's a, there's a very human and ethical failing. So it's, it's to turn that experience into a kind of expansion you know, like even the, the project that Jane referred to, I've just recently done in Barking in London. It's on one of the, uh, oh, it's on the oldest, I think, social housing estate in the world. Um, and it's huge. And it was really interesting because I suppose, you know, some might call me foolish because I'm always taking on projects that, are, you know, which are complex and could land me in hot water. But, you know, I walked into that one thinking, well, I need to take on everyone, you know, and take everyone in this community with me because you have and it's a community which has its tensions there's you know white working class jewish N nigerian somali pakistani it's you know uh, lithuanian it's all going on and you know trying to sort of you know and it was kind of do you, do you worry about the social and political impact of your work sometimes no and yes you know you worry about doing a good enough job to kind of do justice to the communities and the and the collaborators who've worked with you and been generous enough to trust you in 
go with you on a journey where you're not quite sure where yeah. the adventure's going to end up. I agree as well, because I think sometimes you don't want to be a gatekeeper to your own community, but you're speaking from a place that is very personal to you. Um, and whilst you don't want to stereotype and stigma a whole community, there's that responsibility on both sides. Sorry, Jane, are we... No, 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 I was oh. just keeping an eye on the time because it's not five to nine already. Okay. So. okay, can I ask my final question? Yes. yes. <laughs> um, I just wanted to ask about legacy. Uh, within this, um, with the concept of Bangladesh, because for me, there was it was such a magnificent event for the for myself, the families, and the communities that I brought in. It was gearing up to it, coming out of COVID. It was like I said, such a joyful, happy project event day out that people were looking forward to so much. And I remember on the coach, it was like a really carnival atmosphere. We were doing karaoke. You know, there was we had great fun. Um, but also because I took multiple generations of from the youngest to four right up to the eldest of an 87 year old Bangladeshi woman. Th there were so many things that people just didn't get the chance to talk about. And with the title of it being Concert for Bangladesh, they almost had permission to talk about certain things. So I remember like on the coach, one of the little boys said, oh, we're going to have samosas Bang in Bangladesh, they're called Shingaraz. Another little boy said, oh, what's that? And then another little boy said, oh, it's like a pyramid shape, 3D, 2D, you know, having all these lovely conversations. And then some of the women singing the Bangladeshi national anthem and things like that. But I think one of the key things was working with Helen and Damon was barriers that could have been there were eliminated. So whether that be a prayer room there, whether it be halal, halal food to eat, vegan, vegan sweets and popcorn, having accessible seating, all these things matter. And I think that's what made it a success. And I think the legacy will continue with the communities that certainly that I've brought down because they're still talking about it. And it'll be one of them key things that they can talk to still about in 10, 20 years time. And the projects that I personally work with, that's what I want to have a legacy with the head and the heart, whether it be in a micro level or a macro level. I feel that's really important. What, what, do, you, what, will you, what do you think? Well, I'm... I couldn't hope for a better result than to have that kind of legacy that might last 10 years. You know, um, if it did 20, I'd be, you know, <laughs> I'd really feel we'd, we'd achieved something. And I don't think it would have happened without you, without Helen, without Damon, without Jane. You know, I think it requires to go the distance. You need people to go the distance with you. And it requires a number of people to come together you know, you hadn't even seen the thing and you got everyone organized to come down. It could have been, a, you know, it could have gone terribly, terribly wrong. But you sort of believed in what I was doing. And, you know, I knew your work and we got to know each other through the process of making this. And that's added to my journey. Absolutely, because one of the key things for me was, like I said, the emotional and psychological impact of some of the audience that I was bringing down and having the conversations with you prior eliminated all that for me. So then I could go back and, you know, do that prep work with the people that, and the participants that I was bringing along to alleviate any fears and worries. So come that time, it was just a matter of something that was joyful and celebratory. And I must say, you know, knowing your practice and your work, I felt supported by you in terms of, you know, almost being there to kind of help people in. I hope people might then feel more able to, and I'd love to know if this would be the case, but I, I hope um, those communities would feel more able to revisit Yorkshire Sculpture Park. Absolutely. I think what, what there were so many lovely things that happened on that evening, but I remember part of the engagement programme, we brought one of the women's group down to Yorkshire Sculpture Park the week before, and one of the women had brought her two daughters to the concert for Bangladesh, and she was near the Barbara Hepworth piece, and she was talking about families and the sculpture, and it was so lovely that she felt confident to speak about this sculptural piece in, in her own mother tongue language and in, in her own interpretation and words. And then when we were coming home, surrounded by sheep, um, there were there were so many conversations. They were so inspired by your by by the concept of Bangladesh, and they said, "Oh, we we could have done this, and we should have done this." And that's what you want. You want conversations to be created, and for them to have their own spin on this. And hopefully, we'll continue that with the engagement program. 
Thank you, Tamina. Beautifully put. And also, Ashley Zad said, thank you for the incredible work that you did in um, working with those different people from the community and bringing them. And um, yeah, it's a testament to your fantastic work. And also, as we're committed to artist development as well at Yorkshire Culture International, so it's really lovely that you've had a session about your work, talking to Shazad as well, artist to artist. Um, so that's a, a lovely development. As I'm aware of time, I just wondered if anybody has any questions that they might like to ask Shazad or Tamina while we're here. Yep. In the second half, who's Kanaya or Kenaya? Kenaya is, I guess, the human form of Krishna. Um, and it was thinking about taking it from a religious space into a more thinking about, I, um, I mean, I was, that was a really, to be honest, that was one of the most, that was the most difficult section to edit and put together. And I was interested in that idea of, you know, the broken vessel and then putting that with some of the news, um, newspaper sort of imagery from 71 and thinking about how something really delicate and fragile was broken when it didn't have to be. You know, if we think about most human tragedy, it's it's sadly avoidable. Um, so it was trying to sort of take the mythic into the everyday and into the historical. And, you know, it was um, in a way because there were so many people that I felt was really important that there were so many stakeholders. So we had music programmers and producers from Dhaka. We had you know, people from the diaspora in the UK, people from the diaspora in the States, um, the foundation and their curators. And, you know, so, so much was kind of continually workshopped to try and get a collective kind of idea of, is this crossing a line or is this actually the right juxtaposition that says something really important about how we look back at history, but also how we update it and re- recontextualize it so rather than holding us down it could i think there's a really good balance i think there because you're touching on the past whether that be with the newspaper articles but also look at con contemporary issues such as with the wrapping you know very very modern issues that are going on in bangladesh but then also looking at the high-rise flats and you know looking at factories in one way it's Bangladesh is becoming really globally and economically at the forefront of the garments industry, for example. But at what cost when we talk about global warming and things like that? So I think it, it had a really good balance, and that's always really, really hard to do. Does, does anybody? Oh, yeah, there's a question over um, there. I was just wondering in the second act, um, the, the kind of building structure we saw in kind of different layers. I want to the building, do you mean the building towards the end? No, I mean, during the second act, the building we saw, in some, it seems to be... Might be the tomb back yet. Oh, oh the, uh, yes, at the beginning, yeah. That's, uh, that's uh, Paharpur, which is a Buddhist archaeological site from the 8th century. And we were really thinking about that as a kind of way to think back to a kind of distant past but then also to kind of make it using 3D virtual technology was a really, it felt like a really, you know, also um, one of the things we did was, or that I tried to do in terms of like taking us, you know, stepping back and sort of more holding the artists and what mattered to them was we worked with, you know, once we'd worked with curators and programmers to decide on, on the sort of musical acts and obviously you know, we, we, we knew budget-wise we could make a 45-minute concert, so we had to kind of try and be you know, representative rather than kind of having ev everyone you could have had. Um, and sorry, where was I? But it was also thinking about, uh, yeah, so we worked with each of the musicians to think about what sites in Bangladesh matter to them and that they felt would be something that, that moved them, that, that related to them, and that they felt somehow connected to. And Pahapur was one of the ones that came up a lot. And, and it seemed like a perfect vehicle to particularly to open that second section, which is all about tradition and the contemporary. Um, even musically, you know, I'm, I'm, I, I sort of, you know, I'm, I'm talking about trust a lot, but I must say I was 
I was sort of panicking about whether that section could could work because it's actually the two vocalists are from two different classical traditions and then you know you've got the the sort of contemporary electronic music producers working with them with the traditional musicians you know and that there were three composers for act 2 there's two electronic musician electronic producers from Bangladesh and uh, the sitar player who features Nishit Day he composed with them and the, the three of them were co-composing and I was like you know I remember we were all sort of on the edge of our seats whether that section would come off and then as the rehearsals were were kind of happening and we were kind of what you know I'm still you know I'm almost reliving the excitement but when the rehearsals started happening you're like oh, this is just you know this is genius and 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 a lot of them had not collaborated before but they'd were aware of each other and wanted to collaborate and particularly for like the classical singers you know they were really out you know I bless them they really stepped out of their comfort zone into kind of dubstep and jungle and those spaces and and yet what a marriage you know what I mean if you think about what you know both in the sort of um, Nazrul Sangeet or the classical raga tradition the kind of the vocal range that those two vocalists have I think that's why so many elements work so well because it was a hybrid of of different um, musical genres and instruments and it reminded a lot of people when we were growing up we had to do Bengali dancing at primary school and also uh, we had to learn the Saragama Padarisa, all that kind of stuff but we mixed it up with playing the recorder and things so it just reminded me of so many memories and music does that, it evokes it so much and so well doesn't it? Um, Shilhaya Shazan, did you have all the music in before you started the visuals? Yes, we did. Yeah, yeah. I think it was it it was still really, really difficult to kind of edit and build things, you know, using three D uh, games engines, you know, even with all the music in. But I think you know, at one stage we had thought, would it be possible to sort of, you know, to mix it, <laughs> you know, live and stuff. And I'm so glad it was difficult enough as it was. I mean, I I don't think I'd uh, got that little sleep in a in a while. But also amazing, like during COVID times, you did it all from your studio. I mean, we, with your team that you have working with in, in Dakar as well, but that it was done, yeah, virtually. I mean, well, it was, you know, tragically, you know, Dakar went through a series of really hard lockdowns, the third of which got sort of the military out on the street. So, you know, working with real restrictions. I mean, I, I couldn't, you know, I mean, I've been to Bangladesh before, but I couldn't go out for any of this. Um so there was elements of trust there, elements of, you know, like, you know, and sometimes because we were trying to sort of shoot in real time, but, you know, there was a power outage at one point and then the lighting, you know, so it was, uh, you know, it was, <laughs> it was interesting. And also we were taking so, so many people were taking so many creative risks. And what about for yourself as well, though? Because it pushed your practice in a new kind of like new direction as well. Were you trying out new ways with the augmented reality that you hadn't done before? Yeah, and I think, you know, particularly, you know, making virtual worlds, but one of the key tests is how do you make a virtual world feel, have a human touch? And, you know, this sort of juxtaposition, it was it was something interesting. I mean, what was weird is early in COVID, I don't know if you know Live Nation, who are one of the biggest concert promoters in the world, they got in touch with my studio because, you know, live music was was dying a death. And they were like, can you do anything? And I was like very odd to call up an artist and say can you can you help can you save live music but but interestingly I think you know um we had the meeting and it didn't lead to anything but it did get me thinking like how could I apply some of the workflows I've been experimenting with to to music so in a way that was useful because I'd I'd started thinking about it so when we got the you know when this grant opportunity came around for digital collaborations during COVID it was like oh we have something to kind of to put forward in a you know and I think in that way we'd all been thinking about it me and the foundation and and you know we'd already met one or two potential collaborators so we had a, we had the seed of a project but we didn't really you know 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 where it was all going to end up but I guess as you say you know Bangladesh quite well so that must have helped in that you knew you, you know the landscape you know you have a sense of it so I think it it did help that it wasn't alien to me and mm -hmm. I wasn't making it all up. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a sort of sense where 
you can only do so much virtually if you haven't got a sense of I mean this might sound a bit mad but I think if you haven't got a sense of of like the feeling of a place the, that kind of undescribable something that that's in the light that you don't see or record that's in the 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 sort of temperature the kind of the sensory inputs that are not visual and I think you can only you know you you know you can, <laughs> you can only bring something to life virtually if you've got feeling otherwise it can remain quite cold does anybody have an, another question Yeah, um, well, I'm very happy to talk about the artists and I'm glad somebody asked because we, you know, we, it was a real sort of, um, you know, wish list kind of, uh, so um, maybe I'll just do them in order. So RF Baal and his ensemble who open act one, you know, the, the Baal singers are a mystical tradition and they take on the, the surname Baal, you know, and it's, um, and you know, he comes from the province of Kushtia, which is very much about waterways, and he also does the spoken word. So it became, you know, and he's not, I mean, getting Arif to agree to this when he doesn't have a phone, he doesn't believe in cell phones. So uh, Shomo, one of the um, music programmers and producers in Dhaka, went to Kushtia to track him down in COVID um, and, you know, got him to Dhaka to be filmed on a green screen for a virtual concert. So that was like, that was a bit of a coup. And having, and Arif is one of the, you know, the most exemplary living proponents of that tradition. And we, and I wanted to, I was, I really wanted to feature his spoken word poetry as well. So that was, so, and, and actually he was really pleased that I knew it and wanted to make that an important factor. and. You know, and we actually made him the kind of almost narrator. So that's his voice that comes in again at the beginning of Act Two and at the close of Act Three. Um, Arif is is back in Kushtia. <laughs> he, but he did he did get um, he did get a hookup to watch it on the live stream on August the first. And I must say, I was really dead nervous to see uh, of all the acts. You know, I was I, I really was worried that he'd hate it, but he he loved it so. I was that, you know, I was literally, when it was live streamed on August the 1st on the anniversary of the original concert, it was live streamed at three time zones, so Dhaka, London, then New York. And, you know, literally I was just wetting myself, you know, kind of, you know, waiting for people to, you know, hate mail to come in after the Dhaka screening and everyone going, you know, we hate you. <laughs> I was so nervous about that. And... And, you know, just as each artist sort of, I got a text from each artist or, you know, uh, RF, I got via Shomo, said RF loves it. He, you know, I've just heard from him. Um, and also the fact that RF got to a phone within like 10 minutes of the concert ending and had let Shomo know that he was happy with it was really um, something. And, you know, um, maybe I'll jump to Act 3. So, you know, Gully Boy Rana and Tabib uh, have a huge grassroots following. And I'm, I was a huge fan you know, before this idea ever came to pass. And, you know, in that way that um, occasionally life feels very charmed. I was suddenly on Zoom with Tabib and and was sort of, you know, I suppose, you know, you're a fan of somebody, but you don't actually know what they're like. And he was just such a generous, kind, good person, got it straight away, got that we were trying to raise all the proceeds, go to friendship to kind of work with, you know, um, those um, friendship just to build on what Jane said at the beginning um, they're a charity that work with the, the poorest rural communities in Bangladesh and who live in the Chars which are the sort of um, the worst sort of floodplains in Bangladesh that so those I mean they they are internally displaced refugees year on year because their homes flood and you know it's hard for any medical help to get there. So Friendship have medical boats. They've helped create sort of um, uh, weaving looms. So actually one of the bits of merchandise is actually made by women supported by Friendship in the chars that you can get a scarf with a concept from Bangladesh 
uh, hand sort of applique embroidery. Um, Just do a plug for the website, pioneerworks.org. Uh, yes, so Pioneer Works is our part, one of our partners yeah. in uh, New York who had the sort of back end, so they just let us use it kind of and jump on it for free. So if you just put in Google Pioneer Works concert from Bangladesh, you can find merch. If you love the music, digital download of the album, all proceeds um, go to Friendship, who f finally also, you know, the key thing f was to find a charitable partner who worked with the two things that was closest to the whole team's heart, which was climate and women's empowerment were we just felt really passionate about and friendship do both um and friendship became a really active partner so all the archive footage of waterways etc that was from friendship's archive and that, so it became not just giving to them but they gave to us and it was a really i mean the synergies through the project have been lovely and and just to go back to tabib and gully boy rana they um, sorry, I, I get a bit emotional, but they the the climate change song that ends the whole concert they wrote for this, um, and it's still you know um, I I almost cry every time I watch them performing it because yeah they're just um, they you know and just I was just going to say in Bangladesh they're very much the people's champions so very much like um, my family still watch like Bangla TV so. But it's like a satellite um, TV channel that you can still get. So you still keep your roots in Bangladesh. And they're very much um, grassroots um, artists that are really, really loved by all sections of society. Yeah. Yeah. They're, they're, they're just brilliant. And they really, you know, it's very rare that you meet people who are exactly what they say on the tin. And they're so sound. I mean, I, I really enjoyed working with them. And then just to quickly go back. Uh, and they're doing their thing, as always. Um, they're... You know, they just don't stop in the best possible way. Um, and then the second act was, you know, this this crazy kind of constellation of uh, of electronica musicians, of of classical um, musicians and vocalists who were, you know, at points freaked out by each other. <laughs> you know, there were. I would be lying to you if I didn't say there weren't some odd calls going you know, I can't work with this person or I don't get it. And there was a bit of, you know, different people having to kind of just reassure people, just say, look, we're all on this, t we're all in this together. We're, you know, we want this to be good. We want everyone to be shown in a good light. Um, and, you know, it somehow happened. And I think everyone sort of settled down and is pretty proud of it now. <laughs> Some absolutely incredible achievements, you know, and what a journey and keeping everyone on board and uh, that everyone is so pleased. And yeah, it's great that it has this, this legacy. I just want to say, is there any, are there any more, any more questions? I'm aware of the time. I just uh, wanted to make a comment. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Oh, great. Um, yeah, just as like someone from the Bengali diaspora, it's like, I thought it was so cool. And like sometimes we inherit a kind of vision of Bangladesh that's kind of frozen in time because we're getting it from when our parents were there, but they're not necessarily kept up to date with all the changes that are happening. And I think especially in the arts, you know, sphere. So it's just like really, like for me, I feel like the door's open. I'm like, oh, I'm gonna look this. <laughs> so yeah, I really appreciate that. And ooh, can we see the film anywhere else? You can if you go to the same link of Pioneer Works. Uh, if you type in Pioneer Works and Concert from Bangladesh, it is available as a download for a limited time. Sorry for streaming, not as a download for streaming for a limited time. Thank you. Anybody else? So I'll just leave me to then thank you both very much for, for your fascinating conversation, your honesty, and um, for all the work that you've both done to on the on the film and Nina with all the work you've done with communities. Thank you for coming together this evening to share with us. Thanks a lot, Jane. And, and please check out Tamina's work and her work. You know, you can find it via the Tetley and lots of other places. And I think she's doing an amazing job in terms of bridging a lot of things from therapy to art to kind of community engagement in, in a really necessary and important way. 
And can I just say thank you to Jane for inviting me and Helen from Yorkshire Sculpture Park and Shazad. It's been an amazing project to work on for myself. And um, just, to, just to end on, I think um, minority communities and especially minority artists in this country just need a little bit of support to blossom and grow. And I, this project for me has been so fantastic with the people and the community. It's been a dream project. So thank you so much.